normal day, I'm going to tell you my, I'm going to tell you my praise, like, right quick, because this is moving day for Light in Bethlehem, and I'm so glad it's not snowing or raining, so that's my praise right now. All right, we serve an almighty God. Almighty means he has all might and all power, and he's glorious. And the Bible says if everything else holds their peace, if we don't worship him, the very stones will cry out. Well, I'd be embarrassed if the stones had to cry out. All right, so let's stand, all right? And we're going to sing Almighty, Most Holy God. Oh 
Amen. Great to see you today. As we were singing that, I was thinking about the Almighty God and all powerful God. And I was thinking that, you know, if God ceased to exist for a second, his creation would cease to exist. Because the Bible says not only did he create everything by the power of his word, but he sustains everything by the power of his word. I mean, forget God just sort of not, not existing. If he, if he just if he just like was out of control for a moment, if he wasn't in total control of everything for a split second, then in that split second would be all it would take for our lives to end, for creation to cease to exist, for the planets to stop spinning, the stars to stop shining. Aren't you glad the Bible says he doesn't sleep, nor does he slumber? He's a busy guy. Praise the Lord we have an almighty God like that. <clears throat> Well, it's good to see you today. Good to have you with us. Um, happy October. Uh, we've got some things in the bulletin for you to be aware of, so I encourage you to open that up and just be aware of and be reminded of some of those things. Uh, today, after the service, uh, we're going to have a little bit of a work day. We try not to do that on Sundays, but with everybody here, we're going to move some things from our storage container here behind the church uh, to the church. So it's not going to go a long distance, but we have to have help. And we're going to have to have a truck with probably a trailer. Some of you said you're going to be there to be helping you with that. We appreciate that. But uh, any hands uh, and muscles today, um, we'll, we'll try to keep it about an hour, but you're welcome to go whenever you, whenever you need to leave. But we could use a lot of help today. Um, and we'll thank you for advance for that. This upcoming Saturday is the Men's of Storm Breakfast and Bible Discussion and Prayer Time. So if you haven't been to that, I'd like to personally invite you to come and visit with us. Have a great breakfast. Have a Bible discussion. Have a really great breakfast. And have some prayer time along with a really great breakfast. So uh, I will encourage you to be a part of that if you aren't already. And if you are a part of it, I'd like to encourage you to invite another man. That was our goal from the beginning. And uh, it's been a while since we've had a visitor, so man, I'd encourage you to think about people who you might uh, bring. But that's 8 o'clock Saturday morning for Bible study, prayer, and uh, breakfast. Oh yeah, breakfast. It's all free. Um, I believe those are all of our announcements at the moment, at least that I'm aware of. I would like to read a brief passage of scripture uh, this morning from 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 and following. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens will pass away with a roar and with elements will be destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, then what sort of people ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness? looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, according to his promise, we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness will dwell. What an awesome passage of scripture. What type of person should we be in times like these? People who are looking upward and forward and assured of the Lord's return and bringing as many people with us as we can. Well, praise God. I'm going to uh, open in a word of prayer and then we can continue our time of worship together. Would you like to stand with me as we unite our hearts together in prayer? Holy Father, we do gather today in the name of Jesus, and we're aware that we're also in your presence, Lord. Mm -hmm. 
we are in the presence of Almighty God before we came in here. But collectively, we just want to acknowledge the presence of the Lord. Lord, we ask that you be working. Holy Spirit, we ask that you be, ask that you be moving in every heart today. Search our hearts. Know our hearts and our thoughts and our minds. See if there be any wicked way in us and lead us in your path everlasting. Lord, see if there's anything that's distracting us from being the people that you've called us to be, to being doing the things that you've called us to be doing. Lord, we pray, O oh God, that today as we sing these songs, they are, they are from our heart. It's our heart's expression to you, Lord, the almighty God, the all-faithful God. Loving God, just God, righteous God, benevolent, merciful God. We thank you for all the ways that we experience your presence daily in our lives. All the ways that you demonstrate your faithfulness. That you pour out your goodness day by day in our lives, Lord. And we thank you for it. Today, as we continue our worship, Lord, may Jesus Christ be rightfully exalted. In your name, amen. You might think that lifting up your hands is a holy roller thing, but it's actually a Jewish thing. The psalmist said, lift up your hands in the holy place and bless the Lord. So, don't be afraid to lift up your hands. If we all did it, then nobody would be self-conscious, right? If you need to start right here, start right here. But the song says, We stand and we lift up our hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We stand and lift up our hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship you now, how great and awesome is he. Together we sing, everyone sing. Holy is the Lord God Almighty, the earth is filled with his glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Together we see 
sister-in-law quite, quite a bit 
But on the way out, we had several glitches in the uh, airport, of course. Um, the the 20-minute layover turned into nine, and we didn't quite make it, but they held the plane because the pilot was late. And Dan says, my husband says, you know Grandma's been praying, everything's going to work out. They said one suitcase made it, but all three made it. So there again, we had our protection with our travels, and we had a great time. Very good, Grace. Anyone else have anything to share today? Talking about California, I have a sister who lives out there, and I haven't seen her for five or six years. She's quite a bit older than myself. Her daughter and her husband and I are going to fly out on Tuesday to Lord willing, and we're going to spend about 10 days, and I just pray for safety in the journey, and that we have a good visit. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Pray for a good visit for you, and no problems uh, like Lois had. Um, I just wanted to bring a prayer for Paul Stobie. He is um, staying at our house for a few days, but he's visiting different churches in the area. And some, he's going to be in this area for, for two weeks, I think. And he said some of the people hasn't seen in like six years, so he's really looking forward to visiting with them and just be praying for him. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I have a friend, her name is Jolene Miller. She's been to church here a couple of times, and two years ago she came and helped us with VBS. Um, last week her dad started acting funny, um, and then one day he woke up delusional and he couldn't walk. Um, so he's in the ICU in Erie right now. They think he has like hypertension, I think is the unofficial diagnosis. Um, his kidneys and his liver are failing, um, so just prayers for their family. His name? I don't know his name. <laughs> okay, well, we remember him. <laughs> yeah, Jolene's dad, remember, in prayer. Anyone else? Glenn? Uh, one of the good uses of uh, the internet <laughs> is uh, you'll have uh, people that study prophecy really well. And it's just, um, it's so good to have that available to them. I mean, very... Oh, like Andy Woods and people of that nature that, that are very, very uh, studious about it. And it's just a big help and an, an encouragement to uh, get their insights and uh, just, to, uh, just to help steer you along the way with, with your pursuits. So, yeah. thank you, Glenn. Anybody else? We'll go to prayer then. been singing so much this morning about your holiness. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our songs will rise to thee. You're holy, you're worthy of our praise, and we enter your presence today with praise in our hearts and thanksgiving. We're so grateful for all your many blessings. The daily, truly daily, you load us with wonderful benefits. And, O oh God, we give you thanks and we give you praise for all that you're doing in each one of our hearts and lives. Lord, today we bring our requests before you with confidence. We know you hear us when we call. Lord, we're asking that you would be with Daryl as he travels out to visit with his sister in California. Make this a very special time together. Give them traveling mercies. Just work every detail out for your honor and glory that everything will arrive safely, including the luggage. Oh God, just work every little detail out and give them a great visit together. And we'll thank you. We'll not fail to give you praise. We want to also remember Jolene's dad in prayer. You know this situation. You know, Lord, how critical it is. 
And oh Lord, we're thankful for prayer because we know prayer changes things. We ask, oh God, that you would minister in this situation in a very special way and we'll thank you and we'll give you praise. We also, Lord, want to remember this five-year-old child that was injured in an ATV four-wheeler accident. You know, oh God, the situation. No feeling at all in his legs. And oh God, he's in the hospital in Pittsburgh. Would you minister to this need even now? Lord, be merciful. Allow life to be restored to those limbs, we pray. With our God, all things are possible. And we pray, Lord, that you would minister and work in a very special way. Lord, be with Paul Stobie, we pray, on this time of getting around to see the churches that have supported his missions ministry. Make this a very special time, a time of refreshing. Oh, Lord, just be his strength. Protect him in his travels. Keep him safe, we pray, and we'll thank you. Lord, we want to remember Janice Stevenson in prayer and ask that you would minister also to her needs. You know just exactly what she's facing at this time. <clears throat> and we know, God, that you're able to minister to her every need. Thank you, Lord. Our prayer today is with the songwriter, Savior, Savior, while on others thou art calling, do not pass us by here in Sagertown. Minister today, we pray in a very special way. Speak to us through your word. Make that word alive in our hearts today. Help us, Lord, to apply that word to our hearts. And we'll give you thanks. We'll give you praise in your most holy name, dear Jesus. Amen. newspaper because the colored colored comic section just 
as I speak of it, just brings back a euphoria of feelings again. I'm just living my childhood over again right now. But imagine if you uh, woke up this morning and you had your Sunday paper and you opened it up and the headlines was Glenn's life yesterday and the week before. Glenda, here's everything she did yesterday, last night, in that entire week. It's all in the paper. Headlines, front page. I mean, there's no comics. It's just Glenn and Glenda's. Glenn and Glenda. That wasn't on purpose. It was just Glenn's life, Glenda's life. Everything you did yesterday, everything you did before you went to bed. If you snored through the night, it was in there. Everything all week is in that paper. I tend to think if we believe that tomorrow our whole life is going to be plastered on the front page of the paper, we would tend to live differently today. Is it safe to say that? I think anybody in their right mind would, would, probably, would probably believe that. The history we make today is the legacy we leave for tomorrow. That's kind of our focus. It's a lengthy title. It's more of a principle than a title, but that's it. The history that we make today, things we do, things we say, how we act, how we respond. The, th the history we make today is the legacy that we leave for tomorrow. Everything we did, everything we did, how would it change our life if we did that? The Bible says this. In 1 Thessalonians 5.11, it gives us this admonishment. Therefore, Believers, encourage one another and build one another up just as you're doing. Encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. This lesson is going to be about basically thinking through and being mindful of how we live and how we treat other people, how we treat others, and specifically how we treat God's people, other people in the body of Christ, or other, other Christians especially. How we address other people outside the church, but especially how we address one another, how we deal with one another within the church, within the body of Christ. I haven't, I haven't noticed any big glaring problems. This is just where we are in the book of Judges. God's people at war with God's people. It's a shameful time for you. For in, in history of Israel. But we're introducing, uh, I'm sorry, introducing divisions into the church is a monumentally effective tactic that Satan often uses. Any amens on that? Amen. He knows his stuff. Introducing divisions into the church is monumentally effective effective and Satan knows it works and he keeps doing it his attempt is to distract sidetrack frustrate or defeat the church as we seek to be about the Lord's will and the Lord's business which he has called each of us to because divisions within the body of Christ within God's people wastes spiritual life I mean, catastrophically wastes our life. Discord stains our Christian relationships. Anxiety and animosity drains and exhausts us of ministerial energy. The wiles of the evil one sidetracks us, distracts us, and tempts to thwart the kingdom of God that we're involved in, his efforts. If he can alienate us from one another, then he will alienate us from our mission field. He weakens us. So every day we are faced with certain challenges or opportunities for discord and division. The question is, do we swallow that bait? Do we bite the hook? 
Instead of saying, yes, Lord, use me, we probably wouldn't verbalize it, but we're saying, yes, devil, get a hold of me. But the devil doesn't want us to know that that's his motive. He doesn't know that that works. He doesn't want us to know that. He doesn't want us to work personally or as a church through difficulties or divisions that are among us. People who get, get mad and leave the church, if they haven't tried to work it out, I would say those people, every single one of them, have left and they were outside of God's will. If you're not willing to, 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 to stop and say, okay, we need, we need to work this out. You still may leave, but if you fail to work it out, then that is a sin. You leave sinning. Now, people might leave because the theology is bad. I understand that. People might leave for different reasons. I understand that. People might get mad, try to work it out, can't, and leave. I understand that. But if you just get mad and never show up, just say, I'm just going to take my... I'm just going to go to another church. Well, guess what? You're going to take a problem to another church. Because the problem is not just the person that offended you, but you because you're not willing to do and work at it as God has commanded us. God wants us to allow his Holy Spirit to develop in us his holy character. And that is something that takes place or is supposed to take place in the church. One of the reasons the churches exist is that God uses us, one another, to kind of rub the sharp edges off one another. That's how God disciples people. That's how God matures believers. If we get mad and go somewhere else, guess what? That's some lesson that we did not learn that God wanted us to learn. When we are patient with others, when we are loving towards those who are tough to love, when we respond peacefully towards those who are stirring up trouble, something supernatural happens. When we work through the devil's attacks on us as his children, if we do as God tells us, as his word tells us, then God takes those divisions and turns those things into endurance. And I'll tell you one thing God can do. If you can't get along with somebody, but you take time to, and put forth the effort to work it out, there's a good chance that that person's relation, you, that, that person that you had that broken relationship with, once God mends that relationship, that will become one of the strongest relationships you have. Just got to be willing to go through God's plan to cause that change to take place. But when we work through the devil's attacks, as God tells us, God takes the divisions and turns them into endurance. He takes the offenses and transforms them into perseverance. What Satan meant for evil now, God can use for good. What was intended to bring destruction, God molds into overcomers. And God takes adversity and turns it into victory. He can take the defeated and turn it into a conqueror. If we allow him to. If we allow God to do that. That's what he wants to do. When God's people have strained relationships, when there's discord or division, it's the opportunity. It's the opportunity for all of us to grow stronger in our faith and for God to work through this and to make the church as a unit a lot stronger church. So, this is what God wants to do in the church. So the history we make today becomes the legacy we leave for tomorrow. With every challenge that we face as individuals or as a church, we are either part of the problem or part of the solution. We have that opportunity to be part of the problem or part of the solution. I wish I could say this story had a happy ending. Turn to Judges chapter 12, and we're picking up again. I believe this is the last lesson that we'll have on Jephthah, J-E-P-H-T-H-A-H. -H -H. Several things are silent. 
Judges chapter 12, verse 1. The men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed the Zephon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over with fire. And here, Jephthah realizes that I think they're upset with me. They must, they must be upset with me. We will burn your house over with fire. Verse 2, And Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammon Ammonites, and when I called you, you did not save us from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hand and crossed over against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come to me this day to fight against me? Wow. So Jephthah attempted to avert war with the Ammonites. He attempted to keep peace, but they would not have it. Now, that's in chapter 11, if you remember that. He tried to make peace with the Ammonites. They wouldn't have it. They fought them. God gave them the victory. So here we see a little bit of an insight to the people of Ephraim. Ephraim, if this was, this was what we believe to be the tribe of Ephraim, the people of Ephraim, but if this was one person, if this was a guy named Ephraim, we would have to say, man, I'm glad I only have one of these people in my church. Or Ephraim is a high maintenance person. High maintenance people are easily offended when things don't go their way. They complain and criticize plans, people, and progress while bringing discord, confusion, and frustration to otherwise positive environments and or relationships. So the people of Ephraim are upset that Jephthah did not include them in a recent battle and it it's unclear if it was the most recent battle or another one because of some of the way this is put. But they did, he did not include the tribe of Ephraim in that battle against the Ammonites so that they don't share in the glory. That's what it boils down to. Ephraim didn't get a slice of the glory pie. You went out there. You did a great job. People were having you singing your praises. Why didn't you why, why didn't let us go with you? We'd like some of that. That's basically what it boils down to. The people of Ephraim were very upset. A little bit of history about Ephraim. In Judges chapter 8, if you recall, Ephraim tried to pick a fight with Gideon. Why in the world did you do this? Why didn't you send us to do that? Why didn't you allow us to do this? And they were started picking a fight with Jephthah. And now we have Ephraim picking, I mean, with, with Gideon. Now we have the same tribe or people group trying to pick a fight with Jephthah. Both instances, it seems that Ephraim failed to receive the limelight that they were looking for, or that Gideon or Jephthah sort of stole the, the center stage from them. I don't get the impression that they were expressing these concerns from the servant's heart that needed to be giving of oneself. Oh, I was looking forward to serving. I was looking forward to honoring. I was looking forward to... They're not looking for that. But it seems more like they were praise seekers and wanted notoriety. So Jephthah attempts to keep the peace with Ephraim. He tries to talk it out. By the way, just a little bit of background. There are 12 tribes of Israel that we are aware of. Some, there's a lot of discussion and some think there's 13. But there's a, basically the, the traditionally in, in scripture there's 12 tribes of Israel. Each tribe are the descendants or the family, extended family members down the road from one of Jacob's sons. Every son of Jacob is known to be the father of the Israelites. Every one of his sons became, their families, their descendants became a tribe. A tribe is kind of like a state in America. They would say it's not, but it's kind of like the United States of America. In America, we have Ohio, we have Pennsylvania, we have New York. 
Israel had Ephraim, Manasseh, you know, Judah, and, and then on and on, 12 of those. And so they were basically people groups from those brothers, okay? So what's going on here between, uh, I, don't, well, I don't want to give it away yet, but what's going on here with Ephraim is a little bit of long-lasting brotherly sibling rivalry. Uh, so Ephraim confronted Gideon, and Ephraim confronted Jeff. Gideon, the Bible says, they accused him fiercely or violently. They accused Gideon violently. Judges 12, verses 1, they threatened to burn his house down. We will burn you over with fire. So the history of the people of Ephraim that they are making is forming into a legacy of a very, very negative hate filled, uh, animosity filled legacy. It doesn't look good. The history is building to a very, very negative legacy. So Jacob had, like I said, 12 sons, but he had one son by the name of Joseph. And what the fathers would do when they felt that were, they were nearing the end of their life, they would pass their inheritance on to their sons. They, were named, they would name who got what, and they would, they would give a blessing. It was kind of a Sometimes a prayer type of a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Sometimes it was kind of prophetic. Yeah, he said Judah was going to be a lion's cub. In other words, he was going to be, grow up to be a fighter. Well, Jacob had one son by the name of Joseph. Turns out kind of his favorite son because Joseph was the son that Jacob thought was dead. Only to find out. 30 some years later that he was alive. Not only alive, he was a ruler of Egypt. So at the end of Jacob's life, when it came time to bless all of his sons, there was probably a crowd that had assembled for this, and when it comes to Joseph, instead of blessing Joseph, he blesses Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh was the firstborn, but Jacob blessed Ephraim over Manasseh. Ephraim was blessed over Manasseh. And so he got sort of a double helping of the inheritance. He got the blessing of dad. And as we read through the scriptures, almost every time the, the tribes of Judah are mentioned, especially in the books of Moses, Ephraim always comes first. Almost always come. Ephraim and Manasseh and this, that, and the other time. Also, often in the Old Testament, Ephraim is used to refer to the whole of the nation of Israel. So, historically, Ephraim has had sort of a, a better start, a better blessing. But also he was just viewed, the, 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 the tribe, the person in his tribe just seemed to be more... Um, more upfront and more blessed and got more, more of the notoriety. But that was kind of the beginning of Ephraim and brother Manasseh. Uh, Isaiah 28 verse 1, about 700 years after this blessing takes place between Ephraim and, and Manasseh and the rest of their brothers, Isaiah says this, he refers to the drunkenness and pride of the people of Ephraim whose beauty has faded. 700 years ago, there was this blessing of history, but 70 or 100 years later, we see that his legacy is not a positive one. The person or the people are known for their drunkenness, for their pride, and their beauty or their blessing is like it was never there. Gideon, was from the tribe of Manasseh. So it seemed like because of this, maybe some sibling rivalry was being passed down from generation to generation, not just from the individuals, but to the whole tribe, descendants of each brother. So Gideon was of the tribe of Manasseh. Ephraim tried to pick a fight. Ephraim, the tribe, tried to pick a fight with Gideon, the person. Jephthah, 
the son of Gilead, was from the town of Gilead, which was in the tribe of, guess where? Manasseh. And so now Ephraim is trying to pick a fight with Manasseh again. It's like these brothers must have butted heads at some point, and that's the example that they left, and that's what they kind of passed on to the tribes that represent those brothers. And so we see Ephraim and Manasseh at this point kind of butting heads. So the history we make to get today can become the legacy that we live leave for tomorrow. And the history that we focus on today is not the history, the good positive history of Jephthah, but of the people of Ephraim. Not a few, not a brother or two, but of the entire tribe of Ephraim. God gives some warnings regarding bickering and rivaling and discord between his own people. Proverbs 6 verse 12 says, A worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech, word, winks with his eyes, signals with his feet, points with his finger. With a perverted heart, he devises evil, continually sowing discord, continuing trying to pick a fight, continuing to try to stir up a mess, Continuing to steal away whatever peace might be in the family or in the, in the nation. Therefore, calamity will come upon him suddenly. In a moment, he will be broken beyond healing. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among his brothers. Which is what we see uh, Ephraim, Ephraim doing that. Within God's people, you know, God's people were murmurers. They were uh, Grumblers, they grumbled and murmured against God. They grumbled and murmured against Moses, against Aaron, against Miriam, and they probably murmured and grumbled against one another. Backbiting. This is kind of some of the words that came to my mind with thinking about all this. Discord, strife, backbiting, gossip, drama, pugnacious. I like that word, but never knew what it meant, it, pugnacious. You might know what pugnacious means. It means to be a striker, a striker. Quick, quick to fight back. Quick to throw a punch. Pugnacious. Quick to throw a retort. You know, you said that. Let me, let me just give you that. Hmm, they're here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna treat you and speak to you a whole lot worse than you just spoke to me. Pugnacious. Getting even. Divisiveness. Contentiousness. People with grievances, people with grudges, people who are unforgiving, tearing others down. When that starts happening, it all spreads, it all infiltrates, it all infects, it all poisons, it all destroys. Whether it's in Israel, whether it's in America, or whether it's in the body of Christ, it has the same effect. The truth is, any one of us at any given time, under any given circumstances, can be a pugnacious person. We think I can't. Yeah, I won't. Wouldn't happen to me. We can be the spreader of contention. We can be the distributor of, of, uh, of anger and divisiveness if we allow it. If we allow it. Any one of us can be part of the problem or we could be part of the solution. The history we make today will become the legacy that we pass on tomorrow. So what's the result of Ephraim's pugnacious threats to Jephthah? Verse 4. The result is not a positive. So then, verse 4, Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim, because they said, You are fugitives of, Is of Ephraim, you Gideon Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. 
And the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, let us go over, the men of Gilead, and this was a test to see if they are truly from the tribe of Ephraim or not. And feel free to chuckle because it's somewhat humorous. As when the fugitives of Ephraim said, let me go over, the men of Gilead would say to them, are you an Ephraimite? And they would say, no, no, we're not. Then they would say, say the word Shibboleth. And the man said, Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it correctly. Then, that was the dead giveaway, then they seized him and slaughtered him. They seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan. And at that time, 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. That is, 42,000 of their brothers tribe. Let me ask you this. Who won that battle? I don't think anybody did except maybe the devil. I think the devil may have won that one. What was accomplished? Many of the commentaries and writers refer to this point as probably the most significant part of the downfall of Israel and as one of those turning points in the book of Judges because from here it gets even worse for the people of God. What were they expecting to be the outcome? Manasseh fighting with Ephraim because when Ephraim fought against Ammon, Ephraim didn't invite them to fight with them. Imagine, imagine Pennsylvania to going, going to war with New York. And then Ohio declares war on us because we didn't ask them to come with us to declare war on New York. Doesn't take long to see that that all's going downhill in a hurry. Things are deteriorating fast. But that's what's kind of taking place. When God's people fight God's people, even their, even, even their culture for that matter, the greatest concern is not who wins the argument or who gets their way. But the most important issue is who has now been alienated. Who has now been alienated. And for the Christian, for God's people, I think the most important question is our side winning. Are our issues being addressed? But what is our testimony? How is our legacy being passed on? to the people that God's called us to reach. What effect are we having on those around us in our own mission field? So now let's think about a personal, practical aspect of all this. You know, as Paul was writing this, he was writing to the church. And you read that, you read this and think they're kind of messed up too. When Paul wrote something to the church, if he says encourage one another, he says you're already doing that. But he, when he writes to correct something, it's because something bad is going on in the church, some sin that needs addressed. So in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 says this, it was, it was evidently uh, divisiveness, slander, gossiping, uh, insulting. Ephesians 4 verse 29 says, Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as fit and is fitting for the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. What if we, what if we stopped before we said a single word and thought, Is this going to administer grace? Hmm. I think a lot of us would probably go silent for a while if we did that. But speak that which gives grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander, good night, the people were a mess. 
Let all this be put away from you along with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. So we see, even from Ephraim, even with Ephraim and Manasseh, there was a lot of bickering and discord and horrible, horrible fighting and wars and violence. And I know people will say, yes, but we have the Holy Spirit. That doesn't happen with us. We have the Holy Spirit. And I don't know yet how it gets around him, but it does. This is very positive for the ch possible for the church, for any Christian to be taken up by this and think we're okay. I'm okay. It's, it's her. I only say those words because I love her. I had to point out their sin so that they'll, they'll repent. So Paul writes to address these issues, these is issues... In the church. And I ask you. What type of activity. Does the church. Uh, does What type of problems. Does this activity bring about in the church. Words like that. Feelings like that. Animosity like that. Unforgiveness like that. It, it, it'll tear the church down. It'll tear people down one by one, brick by brick, like we're all a brick. And all of these words are just like a, a war and a battle that blows that brick out of the wall and destroys the foundation that that brick was a part of. The history that we make today becomes the legacy that we pass on tomorrow. Not only do those problems affect the church, but it affects the people that are watching And what we might be tempted to think, hmm, so I need, to, I need to be careful about my speech and how I treat other people because I don't want people to think badly of me. Well, secondarily, yes, but not primarily. Ultimately, our legacy is not about what people will think about you or me, but about what the world will think about Jesus Christ, the Christian faith, and the church. You know, a person can go out to eat and be offended by the waitress. Maybe the waitress. I went, had, a, had a guy take me to, out to eat the other day uh, in Edinburgh. The waitress looked like she had just changed somebody's oil. She had grease under her fingernails. And I remember just looking, and this was sausage and gravy, so I love sausage and gravy. Next best thing to a cheeseburger. I got, I got sick to my stomach. I could not eat that stuff. I couldn't even eat because I saw those, 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 those horrible, horrible fingernails. I was offended. But suppose people go to a restaurant and they, and they eat and, and they get offended. They don't leave thinking, I'm never going to go out to eat again as long as I live. They just find another restaurant, right? Nobody does that. If you go to a mechanic and the mechanic messes your car up, you don't say, I'm never, in, I'm just taking an oath. I'm never again going to take my car for anybody to fix it. Nobody does that. They just find somebody to do a better job. But when it comes to the church and somebody gets offended, the devil's like, yep, there you are. Grab hold of that excuse. You should never go to another church again as long as you live. And the person thinks, I don't think I'll ever go to church again as long as I live. It doesn't work that way anywhere in any other context as Except the church. And if it doesn't speak to you, it speaks to me as spiritual warfare. The devil, if he can just get people to be disheartened by church or turned off by somebody's testimony or the way somebody was treated or things that they did, if he could just get them to, to experience that, then they gotta they are inoculated. They are inoculated from the faith when that happens. So what about the church? What about us? The history that we make today will become the legacy that we leave for tomorrow. So some things to think about. What impression have we made this week? If it was, if what we did this week, if the impressions that we made on people last week, what would it have said in the Sunday paper today? Of you personally, or of our church corporately, or even Christians in America? What would be the headlines of, of the paper? What impact have we made that's 
positive in our community? What battles have we fought? What battles have we won? What points have we made? How many people have we persuaded? Sometimes that's all that matters to us. You gotta believe. You gotta believe what I believe. So in closing, wherever it is, you and I must have that we want to, we must honor Christ with our hearts and our lives before the people that we're ministering to every day. What we do every day will reflect Jesus Christ or what people think Jesus Christ is like. What we do, how we, how we stand up against the issues, and I think I'm all for standing up against the issues, but everything is riding on how we, how we stand up against the issues. We have the opportunity to write our own history. We have the opportunity to write this section of church history. What's said, what's done, how the people were reached. So what are we doing for Jesus? How are we living for the Lord? What business of God are you involved in? We have the opportunity to make history in order to affect our, to, in, in order to affect our legacy for tomorrow. How we act, how we interact with others. I want to read again what I read at the beginning of the service. Since then, all these things are going to be dissolved. He's talking about heaven and earth, planets, everything we know it. Is it one day going to be dissolved by heat as God remakes all of his creation? Since then, all these things are going to be dissolved. What sort of people ought we to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to this promise, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Unless we think that, okay, then everything will be great. Everything will be great. Just think that as that consuming work of God at the end of the ages, at the end times. Think about the heavens and the earth passing away with fervent heat being consumed by God's fire. Think about every soul that we missed for Christ. They will equally be burned up and consumed by the judgment of our God. So has the church left its mark on America? Have we here today left our mark on our communities, on your place of work, at the community center, in your school? Have we made the mark on our communities in Meadville and Edinburgh and Sagertown, Crawford County? Will we be remembered by what we fought against or by what we declared to believe and look forward to. If we believe that the Lord is coming and we're looking forward to that great and glorious day, but we also believe that abortion is ending a child's life, if all people ever know about us is that we are against abortion, then we're missing the mark. If the culture only knows what we stand against and not what we stand for, we're missing it. All things will be dissolved, including the souls, lost souls of our mission field. Will we be known for the wars we fought or thought we won or by a life of holiness dedicated to our Lord Jesus Christ? Holy Father, as, uh, as we think about this, Lord, Father, we, we don't want to be like the people of Ephraim. We don't want to be pugnacious. We don't want to be that to our community, to our mission field, or even towards certainly not to one another amongst the body of Jesus Christ. 
But Lord, we pray that you would protect us by your Holy Spirit. May your Holy Spirit convict us if we find ourselves taken in by these types of spirits as it starts and we involved in it. It's, it's hard to stop. It's hard to step away from that once we're involved in it. But Lord, we pray for that strength. We pray for that discernment. That we can recognize that and rather contributing to it that we can just step away from it or speak words of peace use it as an opportunity to point people to the Lord because that's what it boils down to Lord, the most important thing I pray you to help us to be mindfully making our history today so that we might be effectively leaving a positive impact and legacy on the people around us. And we'll thank you and ask this in Christ's name. Amen.